Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. So I'm hanging out, hanging out here, hanging out here at William Chris Vineyards. So last episode, you saw that I reviewed the Rosé, the uh, Mary Ruth, and the Maved. Um, I got to try, I had two of those. The Maved I had was more of a single vineyard one uh, earlier today. Um, so I'm out here today, hanging out, um, really to kind of uh, show off their new tasting room. And... Um, I got to meet a couple other people from the Austin-ish area uh, that uh, I think it's called Austin Tidbits that they, they work for. Um, so they were doing some other uh, media coverage with me. So I thought I'd go ahead and give a recap of what I got to experience today uh, with a great backdrop of some Texas vineyards. Um, and these are live vineyards. These are vineyards they 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 harvest and they make grapes from these from these vines uh, around here. Um, so let me kind of get started. So first I arrive and there's a little welcome center, it's kind of like a little like outdoor area, they call it the welcome center. And uh, Luke, um, he said, he told us how to pronounce his name, I'm going to pull out his card real quick. Uh, Luke, oh yeah, yeah, we were talking about how to pronounce his name, uh, he said, he said uh, just sneeze, because it's a bunch of, it's a, like I guess like a check, it's a check um, last name, and uh, Persic, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I might have butchered it. I'll ask him. I'll ask him how I was supposed to pronounce it because we were joking about the correct pronunciation and how they pronounce it, or he, how his family pronounces it. Anyway, so Luke greeted us, uh, and um, uh, we started off with a bottle of their their Pet Nat, uh, their sparkling wine uh, made from Blanc du Bois, and the Blanc du Bois is a high is a hybrid grape. Um, uh, when I looked at the Wikipedia entry, it says Various vitis vinifera, including golden muscat, so I don't know what else besides golden muscat, and then native Florida varieties. So the only grape that I know for sure is in it is called golden muscat, so part of the muscat family. Um, one of the big things about that, about this hybrid, um, is that it's resistant to Pierce's disease, which in the hill country, which is where I'm at, uh, the Texas hill country, if you didn't quite figure that out, um, Pierce's disease can be uh, a big problem. Um, and it's spread through a, um, a thing called the glassy winged sharpshooter. It's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a, not a fly, but it's a flying insect. Um, and it kind of, it can ravage a, a, a vineyard. So bad, Pierce's disease is bad. Let's put it that way. So to have a grape that's resistant to it or a grape variety, uh, a vine that's resistant to it is really important to have in an area that Pierce's disease can thrive. Unlike West Texas, where it's so arid and there's, it's really hard for that for that disease to develop, they don't have that problem. Anyway, so the Pet Nat made in, well, it's not really a Pet Nat, it's actually Champenois style. I don't know why he called it Pet Nat, but it's really Champenois. So, um, but they do make a Pet Nat. Anyway, so really, really nice wine. My dad was super surprised. He was like, oh, this is good. So dad was with me. You might see him in the background during some of the B-roll here. Um, I don't think I took on the pavilion, I don't think I took any footage in the pavilion. If I did, cool. If not, you know, just it's a nice pavilion. Maybe I'll take a picture or two when I leave. Uh, then we moved on to uh, where the crush pad basically is. Um, it was an outdoor area, and they had the distemmer. So cue the B-roll of the distemmer. So I have a distemmer. So what does that do? It takes the stems off the grapes. Do they distem everything that comes into the winery? No. Uh, some things they leave the stems on, but for the most part, things are distemmed. So it's a really complicated device that takes the stems off. Uh, so all you're left with is the berries. In the background, you might see it is their basket press. Um, so that's like after initial, you know, after the free run juice of basically the red wines, they go, they take the, they take what's left over and they press it to get more juice. Um, then after that, we went into one of the parts of the winery where they have um, 
uh, basically the bottling line. They also have some active fermentation going on there in barrel, um, so we couldn't stay in there too long because you know CO2 does build up. Uh, but they have a, a permanent bottling line. So if you remember from my Gruet uh, visit, um, they have a mobile bottling line. So there's advantages and disadvantages to having mobile and or permanent. With the permanent, you don't have to worry about scheduling and things kind of mucking up the schedule, like if you didn't get your bottles on time or your labels messed up, um, you don't get your, basically you don't get your supplies or if there's something wrong with the supplies. Um, whereas a mobile bottling line, you don't have to worry about uh, all the expenses of maintaining the bottling line, it's somebody else's problem. So advantages, disadvantages. I did ask if they do um, bottling for other wineries and Luke said they do occasionally, but that's based on the primary reason they have it. Um, then we went into um, another, another part of the winery where we got to see, um, we got to see their stainless steel tanks, but they also have one, they have the first amphora in Texas. I know we saw amphoras at Yano, uh, so I don't know if it's first in Texas or Hill Country, but they definitely got an Amphora. Um, that's kind of a wine club uh, exclusive thing. Uh, they actually kind of sold it on Futures. That was kind of a cool idea um, to kind of pay for the Amphora. And they also have a, they had a concrete uh, egg in there, and they also have concrete tanks. So Dad was there. Oh, I've never seen concrete tanks before. And I was like, well, because you haven't traveled to Europe with me. Um, so what's the difference between concrete tanks and, and stainless steel, let's say? Well, concrete as a whole is a natural insulator, whereas stainless steel is not natural, so they have to have a jacket around it with usually glycol to help temperature control. So if you ever go to a winery or anywhere else that has a fermentation vessel of stainless steel, uh, and you see this condensation on the outside, especially when it's like you know 100 degrees out, actually it's probably like 90 something, 96, 95. Um, that's because just inside there is where the glycol is to help th keep things cool. And then there's another inner chamber or where the, where the actual wine is. Concrete doesn't really have that. It does have the ability to micro-oxygenate, kind of like a barrel does. Um, and also has the ability to kind of, not quite self-regulate, but temperature control is a little bit easier because the concrete, um, there's like a convection that actually happens inside the concrete between the heat of the fermentation and then the outside, even if it is like warm, it's not outside 95 in the winery, but it's probably like a 72 to 68 or whatever. So it helps with the um, keeping of control fermentation. Um, so after that, um, uh, we walked back to well, back, we walked to the tasting room itself. I don't think we went anywhere else. Oh no, we walked into well, we walked into another part of the winery where uh, the guys were were uh, taking out of the, uh, the 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 must. Uh, where the, the after the after the um, first after the initial press, not the press, but the first run juice. So they were taking that out to eventually put into the press, the basket press they have. So I got some footage of that, and they also have some more concrete eggs, some newer ones, and they had a concrete globe. Uh, Luke said it's like on this like on this like um, uh, gimbal, gimbal. Like I'm using the DJI Pocket right now. So it's on a gimbal, so it can turn, but he didn't really show us that. Um, but so more concrete stuff, and then we went to the tasting room. So let me tell you, the tasting room is beautiful. Uh, first, we went upstairs, and I showed some footage, uh, basically right above where I'm at. So you get to see really great uh, vista, and it's kind of a wine, like a wine club area. So people can go up there for like wine club stuff. Um, and then we came back downstairs, and we tasted through some of the wines. So, during our walking around, we so we started with the um, sparkling wine, then we moved into the Texas High Plains Rosé, which I which I reviewed last last episode, um, and then we got into the into the tasting room and uh, we moved on to the Mary Ruth again. So I reviewed that uh, last episode, um, and then uh, after that we did a Roussan. So Roussan in Texas is starting to become a thing. Multiple wineries are kind of latching onto this versus Marsan. So, if you're not familiar with the Roussan grape, it's usually um, blended with a grape card mar called Marsan in the south of France. So, you hear Marsan, Marsan, Roussan, Marsan, Roussan all the time. Um, so, a lot of the Texas wineries are picking one or the other, and I've been seeing a lot of Roussan. This thing is outstanding. It's kind of like 
if you like Chardonnay, but not the oaky, buttery, like that type of Chardonnay, but if you like a Chardonnay style, more like maybe a whitish burgundy, not quite Chablis, um, this is a great kind of, kind of uh, entry level or kind of a great way to uh, gateway wine, as, as to speak, to, to try something different. And it was super flavorful. Um, we were talking about pairings and there's a little bit of ginger on this and he was talking about, Luke was talking about like a, this type of uh, ginger uh, chicken that he was making and I said, I had, uh, the other night, I had a garlic pesto marinated chicken that would have gone great with that wine. Um, and then we moved on to, um, we move on to, I can't remember the red wine, we just moved on to, uh, Moved, the Moved. So, um, not the Moved that I reviewed uh, last episode, but more of a single a single vineyard Moved, and spectacular. So, again, to kind of have similarities, to kind of give someone a frame of reference, to kind of get them in the right mindset when they're going to drink this. So, if you like Oregon Pinot Noir, then you'll like something like this. This is not Pinot Noir, first of all. It doesn't taste like Oregon Pinot Noir, necessarily, but it has certain elements like it. Remember. We're trying to promote that this is Texas wine, not, oh yeah, it's a grape that made somewhere else, we're gonna make it in that style. Um, more spice-driven, earth-driven, uh, it's got the great fruit to it. Uh, then we moved on to a Sangiovese. Uh, a bit lighter style, um, but you could definitely pair this with, you know, Italian food, it is an Italian grape. Um, so Movedra, so Southern Rhone, uh, Italian varieties, again, uh, the theme in a lot of Texas wineries doing really well with that. And then uh, we moved on to um, Tempranillo. So you've, you know that I've done lots of Texas Tempranillos. T Tempranillo is kind of like the flag, the red wine grape that we're gonna, we're gonna make Texas famous for. And you know what? A lot of winers are outstanding with Tempranillo. William Chris, again, knocks it out of the park with our Tempranillo. Um, and then uh, we finished up with a, with a wine they call the Artist Series, which I didn't get the blend, so, so the blend is, if I remember correctly, Maved in order, uh, Maved, Grenache, Syrah, and a little bit of Tanat. Spectacular. Like this, this wine was, to me, kind of the star of the show. Um, not that any of the wines weren't like spectacular, but this was like, I mean, we ended with, you know, a really, really nice wine. Um, and it was a pleasant just conversation. Luke really kind of talked about the winery itself. I also talked about his background. Um, he's a Texas guy. He moved away to California for a little bit. Moved back uh, very recently uh, to work here at William Chris. Uh, brings a wealth of knowledge. Uh, saw saw D, uh, who I saw at Texom. I, you did You don't know who D is, but saw D, um, who I met at Texom. Uh, super super knowledgeable guy. Uh, Josh, not the Josh from 2012. Yes, I was here in 2012. A different Josh um, was with me because um, I was like Josh you kind of changed like you got all buff and like different looking because it's a different Josh um, so I met them and also met Bill the William of William Chris uh, which is my first time meeting him uh, Chris I saw I've met Chris once or twice in the past uh, saw him kind of like uh, he was heading out but uh, overall great experience the tasting room itself is beautiful which I didn't really talk about that, but hopefully I, I showed images of that. Taste Room is outstanding, beautiful job. Um, really looks great. They've got a nice little area in the center. They have like a little like hutch area. You can kind of sit around and hang out. Um, they have like another little tasting bar off to the side. And then I didn't take any footage of it, but they have like a little more private area. Um, also uh, in the back part where you can do like, you know, like uh, they'll maybe have a corporate event. They said they had a corporate event here recently. Uh, kind of before even the tasting room was open, and they uh, you have like an AV system, and you have like little, they can set up the room however you like, little little bites. They have a full not full service, but they have a full kitchen. They're not going to do anything restaurant style necessarily, but they can make food here. They can they can do like a little tapas or other things. They're still kind of working out what they're going to do for like a tasting menu and all that. But needless to say, it's been impressive. Uh, it's been several years since I've been back to William Chris and that was back when I was at uh, I can't remember the name of the place but it was one of those places north, north of Fredericksburg I went on like a little like two-day junket to hang out and they were showing off the place and we went to some wineries went to Garrison Brothers which is over here in, in high also um, and then of course prior visit in 2012 December and 
the place is outstanding. Uh, they did an awesome job. I've seen kind of from afar William Chris's wines. Um, they've always been really good. But they're really stepping up their game right now. And if you're able to get the wines, if you're able to have them shipped to your state if you're not in Texas or within Texas, or if you're able to stop by High Texas and check it out, a little bit of wind, probably let's see a little bit of um, You should come out here if you haven't been out here. Uh, they have outstanding wines, high quality, and this is where, you know, kind of the premium Texas wines are going to be made. Uh, places like this and other places that I've been to and you've seen me visit over the years. Um, and these are going to be, you know, these are the, dare I say, the future cult wines like Napa has their cult wines. I could see these wines going north of $100 at some point in time. Not all the wines we tasted, but some of the wines we tasted, they're already at around $50 retail. So I could see next five, 10 years, maybe not even that long. Uh, some of these wines from Lee and Chris and, other, and others hitting that, hitting that century mark. Um, and they're good wines. They're Texas wines. We're not trying to compare ourselves to California or Oregon or Europe. You know, world-class wines from William Chris, among other wineries that, that you've seen me visit. Uh, and the last 11 years since I moved back, the quality of Texas wines has dramatically improved. So if you think Texas wine is all sweet reds, there's a lot of that still. Um, it's not that. Check it out. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. So um, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, I'll be recording some more episodes uh, also, the week I'm doing this, the night probably, uh, to get me farther into September. Uh, going to Oregon, that is definite. If you've been watching, following my my Facebook, Instagram type posts uh, a few weeks ago, you heard that I might have been going somewhere else. But Oregon for sure, 19th to the 30th. If you're a winery and I haven't contacted you for some reason, in your Willamette Valley, and you want me to come by and do an interview, let me know. I have a drone coming tomorrow. Today is Wednesday, August, I can't tell, August 28th. My drone shows up the 29th, so I will be bringing my drone to Oregon. I wish I could have had it today. Um, and actually, they said, come on back, take drone footage. Um, so I'll have that. I'll be have my drone out in Oregon. So that has to be my very first ep my very first appointment of the day due to I won't explain why. Basically due to FAA regulations and alcohol. Let's just put it that way. Um, and uh, yeah, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below for William Chris to check it out. Uh, you want to send me some ducats to help offset the cost to going to Oregon? That'd be outstanding. And we'll see everyone again next time.